uh, almost everyone knows when uh, we are designing electronic circuits, we should use something what is called decoupling capacitors. And uh, generally, people know we should maybe place them close to the power pins, but it's uh, sometimes difficult to understand why we need them and also what kind of value uh, we need to use and where exactly we need to place them. Is it good enough to place them uh, on the bottom side of the PCB? Do we need to place it on the same uh, side of the PCB close to the pin? Can we place it around the BGA or it has to be, I don't know, under uh, power pins? So that's basically today's topic to understand a little bit better uh, why we need the coupling capacitors, what difference it makes, and maybe also learn a little bit about where to place them and what kind of value we would like to use. Correct? Right. Yep. That's what we're going to talk about. And and to to help illustrate, I'm going to share with you a lab that I do in this class that I teach on uh, PCB design. Now, I, I don't know if, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see. Okay. I can see the so, capacitor. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the, uh, so this is a lab that has a little bit of danger uh, because we're going to use electrolytic capacitors and ceramic capacitors. And, uh, and if you plug the uh, the electrolytic capacitor in backwards, we're going to use a nine volt rail. If you plug it in backwards, this is what happens. And so I always show, I, you know, this is one of the most fun labs. Most of my students get to see is because they love blowing things up. And so we blow up a capacitor because I do this to illustrate, don't do this. Um, and I have a containment vessel that fits over the capacitor because it literally explodes. And, and I have literally uh, blown a hole in a plastic box with a capacitor that shot out. So yeah. it's once I set up deep. my table on fire when capacitor blow up and yeah, yeah. So this is uh, that's just the, you know, and I think this is in the textbook as well. Um, okay, so I want to show you the illustration, the schematic of what we're actually gonna 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 build. So it's gonna be based on this principle of a circuit called a. A, a, it's, it's called a slammer circuit. Here is the, the circuit. And it's really simple. We've got a MOSFET here, and it's basically a switch. Just think of it as a switch. And uh, we get a little resistor here, and we're going to turn that MOSFET on with two different signals. A pin from a microcontroller that's pretty fast. It's in the nanosecond kind of rise time. And then we're all, and so that's when it goes this way into the MOSFET. And then we're using an op amp, which is you know, the, the typical really low cost, cheap op amps that, that we use have a long rise time, they have microseconds. So the rise time of the Arduino pin is nanoseconds. The rise time of the op amp is microseconds, a factor of a thousand difference in the rise time. And that means there's a different DIDT, a different turn on time for the current. And so the MOSFET is connected to the power rail. We're gonna use a nine volt rail in this case. So it's connected to the power rail and we're gonna measure the voltage on that power rail. And nominally it should be about nine volts, but when we get this current surge, when this MOSFET turns on as a switch that opens up with some rise time, when it opens up, we're gonna draw a current in that power rail. Now, as I've drawn this schematic, this is an ideal voltage source. And what's the property of an ideal voltage source? The output is always constant, no matter what. And so in this schematic, if I were to simulate this, I would see absolutely no change in voltage on the MOSFET, period. But that's not the whole story because this is like any schematic. This is assuming that the wire, the interconnect there is transparent, but it's not. That there's really inductance in this path. And so a better model I have for... A question. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. How can we compare these to power rail of uh, a chip? So, you know, everyone can yeah. connect uh, why we need to place the coupling capacitors close to the power pin. Right. And that's this illustration. This is really what's going on. If we use our, we turn on our engineer's mind's eye and we look at those interconnects from the power supply to the die. So the, the MOSFET is like an IO driver on a die. That is literally what's, you know, it's, 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 this is only one of the channels. It's typically CMOS, this is the end channel, but it's basically what happens on the die. When the end channel turns on, the output um, uh, turns on from a, from a, 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 
uh, drives current on that on that rail. We pull current uh, through the power supply, the power rails, and now we have all this inductance. And I've drawn a couple of inductors here. This is the inductance and the power rail itself. And I've drawn a couple inductors to illustrate kind of the, the partitioning of the system. This is the, for example, the inductance on the die. This is the inductance from the the um, this, is, this is the die. This is to the the end of the lead of the package. This is from the package to the decoupling capacitor, and this is from the decoupling capacitor to the rest of the PDN. Mm -hmm. And so I've separated them out. And uh, and so remember what we had before when we had the ideal uh, uh, power supply. None of this was here. It's all transparent. There was no voltage drop. But now when we add, yeah. Okay. So I, now. I think uh, for a very long time, why I was ignoring this is because are not these numbers like super small? Do we really need to care about them? Yeah, super small is a relative term. Um, and, and, and you're going to see in this example that when the rise time is long or the amount of current we draw is small, the DIDT is small. You know, it's the D, if the DI is small or the DT is big, then the DIDT is small. The rate of change of the current is small. And that is the case in a lot of circuits. It's when we have shorter rise times and we have more IOs that switch at the same time, that's when we can have pretty large DIDTs. And the inductances in these paths from the, the die itself to where the the lead is on the package, the, the package lead inductance, that's going to be on the order of a few nanohenries from the, uh, depending on what your interconnect is, from the package lead to the capacitor, that could be a couple of nanohenries. And from the capacitor back to the VRM, that could be in the tens or even hundreds of nanohenries, depending on your design. And we'll see in this example that I'm just using a solderless breadboard just to make it easy to move things around. And, and we'll see in this example that, you know, this inductance in the actual board that we've got is probably like around the order of 10 nanohenries. This is maybe on the order of 10 and this is on the order of 100. Mm -hmm. So they're a little larger than what you'd find in a package, but of the same order. And and really to, to show graphically uh, and, and easy to move around and probe. Um, so we've kind of exploded what happens on the die a little bit, but not by much. And so we'll see the very Im big impact that decoupling capacitor has. And so this is just the setup. This mm -hmm. is no no capacitor here, just to see what that noise looks like, the 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 rail noise. And so, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting. Again, yeah, I would no, like please. to say like, so when you, so basically what we are uh, saying is, that this is very important for signals with very sharp edges, very fast change from low to high and from high to low. Then uh, even this inductance looks super small, small. they are just nanohenries, then this inductance is going to influence the signal. Correct. Yeah, so let's put in some numbers. Suppose okay. that we have a bunch of IOs that are switching, and it's just so we can do it in our head easily. Suppose it's one amp of current that switches, and it's all happening in a nanosecond. So, you know, and a nanosecond is, is a little long for a lot of devices these days. So suppose it's an amp per nanosecond. If we have one nanohenry of inductance, if, if this is one nanohenry and we have a one amp per nanosecond passing through, that means from one side to the other of this inductor, we're going to have a volt. Mm. So wow. one amp per nanosecond times, times one uh, nanohenry, the nanos cancel out, it's one volt. So instead of 3.3 .3 volt, there will be 2.3 volts. And for a very short period of time, because it's only going to be during the DIDT, because uh, when the DIDT stops and, okay, the, the signal's stable, then there's no DIDT, there's no voltage drop. And we'll see that in the signal. Okay. And and if, if this has a, a volt drop, so you're right, it's only 2.3 volts here. If that has a volt drop, everybody sharing that power rail is going to see 2.3 volts. And that's where... Uh, rail, we call this rail collapse or rail droop. 
um, where that voltage on the power rail drops, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And it can be so large it shuts off a device or small enough that it changes the threshold or causes one output to, to, to look like it's a zero instead of a one. Okay. And we'll see that very viscerally. And other okay. questions. So yeah. uh, we are talking about one nanosecond. I would like to give an idea of people what does it mean? I think standard CMOS is like eight nanosecond or the edge or well, five. Um, so here, here's the example. I'm going to show you a microcontroller. This is a really cheap microcontroller. This is an Arduino. Uh, it's using an Atmega 328. There are little millions of them are made. It's been around for 10 years. This is, you know, you know, within this chip was made in the last couple of years. Um, I'm not sure what the technology node it was made on, but uh, this one has about a two nanosecond rise time on it. Um, okay. And and this is the simplest microcontroller that you know high school, you know elementary school kids are using these days. Um, the uh, op amp that I'm going to use is a linear device, so it's not really. It, um, I think it's actually a CMOS device, but it's linear. It's not designed for fast switching. It's going to have microsecond rise time just to show that comparison. If you look at DDR3. Um, the spec for DDR3 is like, I think it's about two nanosecond rise times. DDR4 is uh, about one. DDR5 is 0.5 nanosecond rise times. So nanosecond rise times is really common in a lot of devices. Um, in my class, we use, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, an AHC, which is Advanced CMOS, um, AH, Advanced High Speed CMOS, AHC, um, and it's got a na one nanosecond rise time. Um, uh, there's um, uh, a higher speed, uh, uh, let's see, what is it, a lo an LVC, Low Voltage CMOS, um, which is uh, sub nanosecond rise time. So this is, it's very easy to get simple logic elements off the shelf today that have nanosecond edges. If you use bipolar, then you're, you're talking about eight, 10 nanoseconds, but CMOS, gosh, everything's really okay. fast. And yeah. another question. Yeah. So does it really matter if this drop is only for a very, very short time? Well, uh, uh, it's a fair question. It depends on what else is listening and looking at that rail. Um, and if you have, um, uh, f first of all, if you get this voltage drop on the power rail, uh, everybody's going to see it. And sometimes that'll cause a control line to trigger. And so even if it lasts for a short period of time, if there's something that's looking for an interrupt that is on that line, it may cause the interrupt or the reset. Independent of a logic problem, this is going to create relatively high speed, very fast edge noise on the power rail. And power rails are typically long or large electrical structures in a board, and sometimes they'll radiate. And so it is a source of EMI. Um, in fact, that's often, you know, there are like, you know, four common sources of EMI, but one of them on that list is you look at the noise on the power rails. And that's going to be an indicator. And that's why decoupling capacitors can oftentimes reduce EMI because they are reducing those large DIDT transients that are passing through the, the power rails. Okay. They, they can constrict the high speed currents to the vicinity of the IC. So, okay. I ask all okay. my questions. So we can continue. Okay. Basically, so, so this is basically like situation. Uh, like a GPIO inside of a microcontroller is switching. Yep, exactly. And, and we are going to have a look what can happen yep. on power pin. Right. And we're only going to look at one switching, but I'm going to get, you know, reasonable current out of it. Um, but it would correspond to having, um, I think we're going to get like a third of an amp, which is maybe like, you know, five or 10 IOs switching at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's the circuit. We're going to look at the signal. We're going to look at the um, the current that's switching, and we're going to look at the voltage on the power rail as it's switching. And so let me bring you into the lab here, and I've got a camera on looking at the board that I've set up. Uh, so let's let's get that camera. Okay, and uh, I'm going to make it a little. Yeah, you can see it here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little closer here. We're live here. Here I am. Hi guys, uh, and. Um, and, and here's the setup. And so what I've got is, this is my little Arduino. I've got it programmed. So I want to 
uh, have some of the I.O. switching. And I want to have the I.O. Uh, so I have one pin switching. I'm use as the trigger. I don't want it to be on for very long because I'm going to drive a lot of current. And I don't want a lot of power consumption because uh, I don't want to heat anything up. I don't want to have heat sinks. So it's only going to be on for a short period of time because it's the edges that I care about. And so I've got the the signal here, and we'll see what it looks like. It's about a 10% duty cycle, a little square wave. I'm using, I got nine volts plugged in over here, and there's an onboard um, a five volt regulator on the Arduino. So I'm using the five volts to power my little op amp over here, and and I'm using the nine volts from the power rail from the, this is the um, uh, uh, plugged into the wall. Uh, this is the nine volts. I've got that nine volts and it's plugged in over here. And that's, what's going to be my power rail mm -hmm. that I'm going to use with the, the IO. Okay. And I've got, um, a couple of scope probes and I'm not, you know, I'm not being very careful about, you know, keeping the loop short. That's okay. Cause there's so much noise on the power rail. It's going to dominate everything, but it's easy to do the probe in here. And, uh, and then I'll show you also have my scope and I'll just flash that real quickly here to show you here's the scope that we're going to look at and um uh and then in fact let me see if i can keep that on and then we'll go look at the um the camera and let me make this smaller mm -hmm. so that we can see both and i'm gonna i'm gonna move this stuff up here and here we go so here's here's the setup here's the scope measurement so i'm gonna i'm gonna cheat i'm gonna turn some things off for now just so we can pay attention one thing at a time okay so here's the circuit um uh we're gonna look at the signal coming out of the arduino this is gonna trigger and turn on our mosfet and so here so is the gate signal yeah this is what's going to go into the gate so here it is coming from i'm using one of the pins on the ios here on the arduino it's switching it's coming over here it's going to the input of my op amp and now i'm going to use channel one on my scope so here's my and i i color coded here's the yellow band here mm -hmm. and i'm going to look at the signal coming from the arduino pin mm -hmm. and that's going to be right in here and you know i always say hey before you do measurement rule number nine anticipate what you expect to see we're going to see these pulses i programmed it for like a millisecond on and then off for a while and i'm gonna i'm gonna in fact i'm gonna do it here on the scope i'm gonna um change the time base so here is the time base here i'm gonna uh, right now we're at two microseconds of division i'm gonna zoom way out here uh 500 Here's 200 microseconds. Ah, here we go. Okay, so you can see that it's on for two divisions. And let's see, two divisions is, um, you know, I'm going to turn these guys off here so that they're not in our way. So I'm going to turn off the measurement there. Uh, and so two divisions, and that's one millisecond. So it's on for one millisecond. Here's here's uh, five volts. You know, it's five volt output. It's on for a millisecond. It's off for a while. Let's see how long it's off for. Okay, so here it is, and it's off for, here's like 20 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's on for one off, that's a 20, uh, I'm sorry, that's a 5% duty cycle. So it's off most of the time. So I'm not drawing a lot of current, I'm not heating up my MOSFET or the resistor. That's why it's a low duty cycle. But we're going to care about what happens over here. So mm -hmm. let me zoom back in. And while we're here, let's look at that rise time. Let's see how fast it turns on. So I'm just going to keep zooming in, da 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 Oh my, okay, here we go. Now we're starting to see what's going on at the edge. Look at my time base. This is 10 nanoseconds of division. And here, you know, because it's a short edge and I got, you know, big floppy wires here. Let me show you my camera again. I got big floppy wires here. Um, uh, and I got big floppy wire over here. Yeah, I'm distorting that signal a little bit. Um, but you can see that the initial rise time here is within a division. It's less than 10 nanoseconds, probably five nanoseconds or less. So it's a pretty fast edge that's uh, coming out of the Arduino. And, uh, and now that's going to be one of the signals. And now it's going through. Let me show you my picture again. I, I would like to uh, just point out before you, yeah. uh, before you continue. This may look like a relatively so slow signal because it's like it's only 20 uh, milliseconds. There's like what 50 hertz or something. I don't know. Oh, the duty cycle. Yeah. Uh, I mean the the repeat frequency. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. It's very low. It's not it's hundred like 50 hertz. Not hundred yeah. megahertz or something. It's 50 hertz. Right. Okay. Right. Right. But 
you know, as we always say, it's not about the fre the yeah, clock I, frequency. I wanted the to point out these because yeah, very very true. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's why we're only going to focus on the edge because it doesn't matter what the clock frequency is, uh, the noise happens on the edges, and this is going to show that very clearly. Okay. So this is the signal coming out of um, the Arduino pin, the nano couple of nanosecond edge, and then I'm going to use the second channel here on the scope, and I'm going to measure the output from the op amp. Now I have, uh, so so here. Here's what it is. The signal goes in. Here's the op amp, and I have it in a follower, just straight up follower. So the output matches the input, but it's at the slow speed of the op amp. And so here is the output of the op amp. And now let me turn on. I got to turn on um, a channel two here. That's where the signal. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, it's such a slow. I really have to slow down my scope here. Can we also show okay. the schematic again so everyone? Sure. Knows? So here's the schematic. So here's what I've got. I've got the pin coming in. That's what we're looking mm -hmm. at in yellow. That's the fast edge. It goes in here. Here's a follower. And we're looking at the output. And so we're looking at mm -hmm. the output of the op amp. And it's going to turn on at its slow rate. Okay. And then we're going to select which one goes into the gate of the MOSFET. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're looking at, at this pin. Uh, That's the output, yellow and, and then the other Yellow. One. And this is the red one. Yeah. Okay. So let's... Um, uh, let's look at the scope. Here's the scope. And you can see the, the difference. Now, I have this on two microseconds of division, and you can see the turn on time for the op amp output. It's about the same voltage, not quite the full range because, you know, I, this is it's using the five volt rail for the op amp. It doesn't go completely rail to rail. It's a couple hundred millivolts off of the rail, but it's pretty close. And you can see here's on the same scale, here's that rise time of the, uh, of the, uh, microcontroller pin. Here's the op amp. So we're going to look at the comparison of those two. Uh, 10 nanoseconds, 2 microseconds. Factor of, what is that? 500 in rise time. Okay, so those are the inputs. Now I'm going to start using the um, the, the long rise time as uh, our input to the gate. And we're going to look at the noise uh, on the gate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch our trigger to the um, uh, uh, so here's the trigger now. I'm looking at the um, the op amp uh, the op amp output. So it's that long edge, uh, and then on uh, let me get you my camera going here, and um, and now here is the red. So here's the you know the real red band. I'm trying to color code here. Here's a red wire here. So this is going to be channel two. And we're going to look at the rail. Now, before we do the measurement, rule number nine, what do we expect to see? Well, it's um, it's a, it's a you know roughly a nine volt rail, just about nine, and it should be constant. It's a power rail, right? It should be constant. So uh, let's look and see what the power rail is. And so I'm going to look at the voltage on the power rail, and, and you notice I don't see anything because yeah. hey, my scale is only going to eight volts, mm -hmm. right? So I need to up my scale a little bit, or you know what I could do? Let me just let me just bring down. it down. There you go. Yeah. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna move move it down, and here's where my zero is. I'm gonna move zero down here. Okay, so here's zero, and here's my eight volt rail. Mm -hmm. And you can see normally it's you know it's a it's nine volt rail, a little bit a little bit you know under nine volts. And I'm gonna slow down the edge a little bit just so we can see the whole thing here. And here is look at the signature. Mm -hmm. When it's driving, it's a little bit lower. Okay. Yeah. Look at that. When it's when it's turning on, it's a little bit lower. Now that's not switching noise. That is another type of noise. You know why I don't have the full voltage when the MOSFET's on, and it goes back up when the MOSFET's off. How come? Because there is, uh, I guess it may be resistance or something. Right, and it's because of, and I'll show you our schematic. This is where, you know, when we add the features of, you know, if it's an ideal voltage source. It's just constant voltage, period. But really, all voltage supplies have some output theven resistance. And that's what we're literally measuring when we have this. So we have some current flowing through the, the resistor, current flowing through the power rail, and that DC current gives us a DC voltage drop across that resistance, whatever it is inside the power supply. And you know we literally could uh, measure what that is from 
from the scope because you know just i um, okay so i'm going to cheat i'm going to move this in the middle because i want to expand and get a good measure of what that is so so what is that that is um i'm at 200 millivolts of division that's like 400 millivolts of drop on the rail okay and, and you'll notice you see this stuff over here remember we're looking at the power rail what do you think this stuff here is you know, we see this no, a little bit of noise here. Any idea what that is? Huh? That is, I'm using a cheap um, uh, switch mode power supply. Oh. And this this is the switch mode power, or th this is the switching of the switch mode power supply. It's not much. Look, this is 200 millivolts. This is like 50 millivolts or less out of 9 volts. So this is less than a percent of noise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we... I've got a 12-bit scope here, and we have really great resolution, so uh, we can see it easily. Um, but that's not part of the switching noise. This is the the DC drop of 400 millivolts, and we've got um, the uh, given the the voltage and the current and all that. We've got about 400 milliamps of current that's switching and 400 milliamps goes through this Thevenin resistor and gives us 400 millivolts. We can do that in our head. The resistance, that Thevenin resistance is 400 millivolts over 400 milliamps, one ohm. Hey, we know the output series resistance of our power supply. It's one ohm. So that's what that is. The uh, switch I have noise Sorry. So yeah. it would be like resistance of the power supply plus smaller resistance of all the wires and everything, correct? Yeah. And when you put in the numbers for, okay, how much resistance is there in the wires and all that, that's in the tens of milliohms. Okay. So that's really small compared to the output resistance of the power supply. But mm -hmm. those all add up in series. You're exactly right. Um, so this is, we're just looking at the noise signature. The switching noise is happening during this time interval here. So let's zoom in and see what's going on there. So I'm going to go back to our time base here. I'm going to zoom in. So we're, we're expanding the time base, we're, we're zooming in. And now you can see in addition to, there's that little bit of switching noise from the switch mode power supply, that's giving us the fluctuations. We have the voltage drop, that's the series resistance, but this is the DIDT switching noise. And on this scale, it's not very much. Look, this really long rise time here gives us some switching noise. You know, a small amount, this extra amount from here to here. Let's see, we're at 200 millivolts. Maybe it's 50 millivolts, small amount. It's a who cares because remember, we're zooming in. Two microsecond rise time, I don't care about switching noise. And remember, in this circuit, let me show you my picture again. In this circuit, there is no, or you can see there's no decoupling mm -hmm. capacitors going to, here's the power rail. on. So here's power coming in. It's going way back to the wall. That's where the VRM is. It's going through here. It's going through this wire. It's going through here. It's going all the way down here. And then it's getting into the MOSFET and I'm measuring it literally right over here. There's no decoupling capacitors. All the inductance of the power rail and all that inductance and this DIDT because the DT is so long, is so big, gives us a tiny bit of switching noise. So everything works okay. fine. Yeah. And that's why, you know, who cares about decoupling? I don't have any decoupling capacitors. Who cares? Now, let's look at that noise when we use the, the fast edge Direct to turn on the current. Direct GPIO from Arduino. Yeah. And I'm going to change the scale just so that we can see it a little more clearly. So I'm going to go back and here's our, uh, let's see, two volts of division. I'm going to take this. I'm going to move it back up here. Uh, we'll go up, up here and let me adjust. I like nice, even numbers. My students, I drive them crazy because I say, adjust your scale so you have nice, even numbers because it's easy to read that way, right? So here's here's eight volts, six volts. Here's that power rail. Here's a zero down here for the power rail in, in red. And then yellow is the, the signal. So I'm going to switch the, um, the signal that's going into the gate. So here is the signal in the gate. I'm going to put it in here. There's the signal in the gate, right? And I'm going to show you my camera now so that you can see what I'm doing. So I'm measuring the voltage in the gate. And uh, and now I'm going to, here's my mechanical switch. I'm going to move the input of the gate to pin 13 input, the fast edge input. So I'm going to take my switch and I'm going to move it 
over here. Okay, now uh, you can see yellow again is the input to the gate. We're using the Arduino pin, so it's switching really fast. And I don't know, you might have blinked and missed what happened here because we were zoomed way out. Uh, let's zoom in and look at the edge. And so I'm going to change my time base. And I'm going to zoom us in. Here we are, a, a microsecond of division. Here we are at 500 nanoseconds. Here we are at 200. Here we are at 100 nanoseconds of division. 50 nanoseconds of division. Now, remember, when we looked at that pin, it was like 10 nanoseconds. This is 50 nanoseconds of division. This is... This is, oh my gosh, this is like a more than 50 nanosecond rise. The rise time changed. How come? How come we have a, a longer rise time uh, for the signal going into the gate? Well, look what happened to the power rail. I mean, here's, here's the 9 volts. Here's ground down here. Our, our voltage droop on the power rail, oh my gosh, it's below 4 volts. The voltage on the power, that's like that's like three and a half volts. It's supposed to be nine volts. It's down to three and a half volts. And that's because of the large DIDT and that inductance. And effectively, what we have done is we have turned off the um, the gate. The gate's not the, – the poor little MOSFET gate, it can't switch fast enough. We're seeing the – the, the the impact of the the CMOS device mm -hmm. being turned off the rail went so low. Mm -hmm. So because the power on the on the MOSFET is suddenly three volts, then uh, it cannot switch. Yeah, uh, yeah, so fast. Yeah, and so but even so, fifty nanoseconds is the rise time, and and look, we all of that voltage drop on that gate is gone. So let me get you the picture again. So here's what's happening. We're looking right over here. That voltage on the rail, look, we had a beautiful, wonderful signal on the rail. And if I zoom out on time, let me, let me zoom out on time. And here you can see the same behavior we were seeing before. Here's, uh, here, here it is when, you know, no, no current draw. Here it is when we have that little bit of current draw, the three, 400 milliamps or so current. We see that voltage drop. Here it is, it's off. But now we're zooming in on this region over here, and we're seeing that, Oh my gosh, during that rise time, that's when we have the switching noise. That's why we call it switching noise. It happens during the switching edge. And it doesn't matter what the he said he said before. We're not looking at the clock. I don't care what the repeat frequency is. I care about the rise time of the signal because the noise is happening at the rising edge. So this is the switching. This is the problem. So all we've done is identify this is the problem we want to solve. It didn't happen when we had a long rise time. It only happened when we had the short rise time. And uh, and now let's see if I can – let me see if I can do a little trick. We're measuring right here. Let me save this. Let me see if we see a difference. If I move here, I'm going to have less inductance. Not mm -hmm. a lot less, but a little less. I should have a little less voltage drop over here than here because I have all of this inductance as the voltage drop. If I move it over here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not have this much I'm curious because it's just like yeah. direct uh, copper there, uh, like. Yeah, it's just copper wire. Is the traces in the subtle breadboard? Yeah. That's all. But it's inductance. You know, the length has inductance. So let's see if I can save this data. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to save this waveform. So I'm going to save the waveform. Um, it's in channel two, so I'm going to move it to channel two. I want to move it to memory. I'll may I'll move it to M1, uh, and uh, and there it is. Okay, so we're mm -hmm. saving that waveform. It's we're still seeing the live one. Mm -hmm. There's the live one, and now let's just move it. So let me get the camera oh, back. Yeah, let's see if we can see it. I don't know if there's be enough of a change because after all, it's the inductance from here all the way to here and all the way back to where the power rail is. So let's see. So I'm going to move it to the other end, and I'm going to move it way up to here. That is. And change. hey, there is. Not a lot, but I I decrease this inductance, but I have all of this path all the way back over to here. So, but it's a hey, it's a noticeable change, right? There's less noise. If I can reduce the inductance of this whole power rail, even though I have the same DID, I'm not going to change the DIDT, but I'm going to reduce that inductance. I'm going to reduce that switching noise, that rail collapse. So let me go back to our our other position.
So we can see the full amount of rail collapse. So here it is. There's the full amount of, of rail collapse. So I'm way down here. In fact, I've got it a little bit closer mm -hmm. even. So I got a little so bit more than we had before. Be, yeah. Because I moved it. And now I'm going to say, well, you know, I've got this whole path. I only need during this rise. It's, it's oh, look, I, I even, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I changed the scales, 100 nanoseconds of division. Let me go back to our 50 here. There we go. And let me turn off the, the memory now. We don't need them. So here's our, our rail collapse. I, you know, I only need the, uh, the current to be supplied during the DIDT time. The rest of the time, uh, the, okay. the, the edge is, is turned on, it's steady state, and I'm not going to see the switching noise. I only need to supply current during this period of time. For to minimize the switching noise, and so if you know we can do it in our head, let's call it a hundred nanoseconds is the um, the uh, uh, the rise time, and if it's an amp in a hundred nanoseconds, so it's only as ten to the minus seven seconds, uh, and it's an amp, so I need ten to the minus seven coulombs of charge. That's all I need, and if it's at if I want a one volt change in 10 to the minus seven, that's, you know, we're doing this in our head here, but that's like a 10th of a net, uh, that's a 10th of a micro farad of capacitance. It's not a lot of capacitance I need to, to reduce the, the voltage droop during this period of time. So it's 10 like a uh, hundred nanofarad, 0.1 oh, micro, okay, yeah. but that's for one volt. If I want it to be less than a volt, if I want it to be 0.1 volt change droop, then I went one microfarad. That's still not much. One microfarad is all to minimize the switching noise. How did you calculate so, this? Can we see some equations? <laughs> so I'll give you two answers. The, some the hints. Short, if, yeah, anyone the, would like, the, uh, if anyone would like to the, the, calculate. The quick answer is um, I covered in in the textbook I mentioned. Uh, it's from Artec. It's called uh, uh, Practical Prototype Design Using Solid Spreadboards and PCBs circuit boards and it's a really simple calculation i think i maybe i have it in here uh let's see do i say oh here we go okay estimate the size of the decoupling capacitor you need to use and and so here's the idea you know if you have a capacitor and you draw current from it the voltage keeps dropping and the rate at which the current the mm -hmm. voltage drops on a capacitor is the is the current draw divided by the capacitance and i want so I need to know, um, uh, so, so here's the capacitance I want is based on, I have this much current draw for this amount of time, and it's gonna give me this much voltage droop on the capacitor. That's the calculation. So if I have a, in this case, it's, it's a 0.4 amps of current for, I used one microsecond, and I want no more than 0.4 volts of drop. Let me put in there as this microfarad. So, you know, you put in your numbers. If it's a nanosecond and uh, and it's only, you know, a 0.1 amp and it's, uh, you know, 0.1 volt, you can figure out, you know, okay, it's 10 microfarads. But it's on that order of capacitance is, is what we need. And so we're going to, I'm going to show you the impact of that voltage droop with a couple of different um, capacitors. Okay, so as long as we're above that threshold, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how much capacitance we need. Okay, so that's the analysis we're going to do. And now what we're going to do is we're going to place the capacitor at different locations. Mm -hmm. And the, we're going to look over here, and it, we're going to get as close as we can, and then we're going to move farther away and farther away. And effectively what we're doing is we're, we're going to provide local charge for that DIDT to come from that capacitor so it doesn't have to go through all the inductance of the mm -hmm. VRM. Okay, so let's go back to our picture so here's our scope. We got it back. We got the terrible inductance in this path. And now I'm going to, I'm going to do what everybody does says, Oh, I'm going to find the biggest capacitor I can. And I'm going to use that as my decoupling capacitor. So, uh, so I've got the biggest capacitor I can find is a thousand microfarad. And again, want to make sure I, you know, here's the minus here because I don't want to <laughs> reverse bias it. Um, and so I'm going to place it really close to the capacitor. Or to the MOSFET. Here's the MOSFET here. I'm going to place it right here. All of this inductance, all the way back, I'm going to be eliminating because I don't have DIDT flowing through there. All the DIDT is going to flow through the capacitor. So I have to remember, inside track is ground, so I get the minus on the inside track. And so now I'm going to place it right here. And so there we go. Uh-oh, mm. did you blink? 
Okay, let me do it again. Here it is. I've taken it out. Let me save this waveform again so okay. we can compare it. Okay, so this is going to be the worst case. So I'm going to save the waveform. It's going to be C2 memory. I'm going to turn it on there. There we go. And let me get my camera back. And now let's add that capacitor. I have to be careful. I don't want to blow this up, especially on camera with you. <laughs> uh, okay, and let's see. I think it's going to be this way here. Okay, so now I'm going to insert it. Up oh, there it goes. And so now I have all the DIDT that's going through here. The power rail is going to be flowing through this path over here. None of it goes over here. And so this is the voltage now that I'm seeing on the power rail because of this DIDT. I have no questions. It's, like, yeah, is it not important what kind of? I don't mean like value now. What kind of capacitor you use? Are not some like slower? Some are faster? Well, what makes them slower fast is their inductance, and this is so the inductance here from the here's where the gate is. This is where it's switching, and here is the distance and the power rail. This inductance from these wires is probably I don't know three or four times larger than the inductance mm -hmm. of the capacitor, and so. Yeah, you don't want to use an electrolytic capacitor as a decoupling capacitor because it's got more inductance. But in this example, the the interconnect inductance is so much bigger than the mm -hmm. electrolytic capacitor that I'm ignoring the impact of it. Mm -hmm. But but suppose so. Let's do two experiments. First is let's move that capacitor farther away. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen? So I'm going to save this into another memory location. So we have here's the waveform. And I'm going to make it into two. So here's here we here we saved it. Let me get my camera back. Uh, suppose I move it over to here. We'll move it far away. So when I unplug it, we're going to see a noise here, yeah. just like we had before. And then when I move it over here, we're going to increase this length by I don't know maybe a factor of two or three. Yeah. So it should be larger. Let's try it. Should it and be, see. but I yeah I don't it know should, how. Yeah. Much. Yeah. So let's try it. So we take it out, and yep. It's gone back to what it was, and now I move it way up here. I have to be careful. I don't want to blow this up. So let's see. <laughs> ground is on the inside. I Hey, you know what? I have to triple check because as I yeah. get older, I get a little bit less uh, – pay less attention, and uh, and my students get a laugh out of it. Okay, so now you can see this is what we had when we were close. This is what we had when we were farther away. Yep, we got more noise. We got more inductance that is in this path that's switching, still a lot less than all the way back here. And so what this capacitor has done, it is separated out. It has decoupled this circuit from all of this inductance in the power rail. We still have this inductance from the IC pin to the capacitor. We still have that, that's what gives us this drop here, but we've decoupled the rest of the inductance in the power rail. The closer we can move that capacitor, the more inductance in the power rail we, we decouple from the switching element. So it's like we move what, the power supply closer. We move the power supply closer. We moved a local kind of a surrogate power supply closer to uh, the chip. And that's why we call it a decoupling capacitor because it's decoupling the rest of the inductance in the system. So let's move it back over here so we get that same signal we've seen before. And let's just make sure I'm doing this right. Let's see. Okay. And and so here is, you know, basically what we're seeing before. And now let's take out that 1,000 microfarad capacitor. And I've got here a 1 microfarad capacitor. Let me just see if I – yeah, here's a, here's a 1 microfarad capacitor. And here it is, this tiny little mm -hmm. guy's 1 microfarad ceramic. And now I'm going to place it in this location as well. Mm -hmm. And you can see here it is, just like we had before. What's going to happen to the switching noise, do you think? I think it's going, as you say, the, because we already crossed the maximum of the capacitance, what we really need, it should be similar. But but wait, this is a thousand microfarads, and this little baby here is only one. I'm going to decrease the capacity by a factor of a thousand. But you we think need we're going to get the same the amount of only for these hundred or fifty <laughs> nanoseconds. That's exactly right, and that's what most engineers don't realize. They think more is better. Uh, if a thousand microfarads gives me this much, one microfarad is going to give me a lot more switching noise because it's a smaller capacitance. Let's see. 
So I'm going to take out this one. So I took out this one back to where we were. And now I'm going to put this small one, see if I can fit it in here. I'll put this small one. It doesn't matter now, the polarity. Mm -hmm. this, and I just put it in there. It's and what better. did we get? <laughs> Look at that. And why is it better? Well, that's because it still has this inductance, but it doesn't have the inductance of the leads of the capacitor. Mm -hmm. So net is slightly less. But it's still, the switching noise, it's still virtually the same. It's not about the size above a minimum. It's not about the size of the capacitor. It is about the inductance. It's about getting the capacitor as physically close as you can to the um to the element that's switching, and then um, uh, it's about making sure you have enough capacitance. And this is, so I think, this, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. go ahead. Well, this is why, so we what, what this tiny little capacitor has done is decoupled all of this inductance from the power rail back to this guy. Huh. It's, and it's all about the, the edge. I just uh, wanted to point out that because we are working with this one nano Henry, 10 nano Henry, I would like to mention, so what is the inductance of a via, for example? I think we should mention this. Yeah, so, okay, if you go through the board, so you have from the top to the bottom of the board, and you have a power and a ground via in close proximity to each other, rough rule of thumb, about a nanohenry per millimeter, typical 040, you know, a, a standard, you know, a board is uh, 1.6 millimeters. So we're talking about, you know, one and a half, two nanohenries for the loop inductance of a, of a via power, so power it ground means via. If you place the, the coupling capacitor on the same uh, side where the power pin is and very close to this power pin, it may be even much better than placing it on the bottom side so of the PCB. Now comes that question you're asking about, well, the whole purpose of the decoupling capacitor is you want to mount it in a way that minimizes the inductance mm -hmm. from the lead that's of the, the power pin to the capacitor. But and we so need both, both you, sides, ground and also power. We need power and ground, right? It's the loop. I didn't really you know, go into that in detail, but yes, the, it's the loop inductance of the power and ground path. And, and so it's the question now of, well, where, what location for the decoupling capacitor gives you the lowest loop inductance between the uh, capacitor and the power and ground pins of the IC? And this is where engineering the power distribution network is really important. If you have a very low inductance path from the capacitor on the surface of the board to the power and ground pins of the IC. If you make that path really short and wide traces, then you can have less than um, nanohenry loop inductance. But if you can't fit it close by, or you have to use a narrow trace to route it, you could easily get five or 10 nanohenries in that loop inductance. If you have a location on the bottom of your board under your BGA, for example, and you can literally put an 0402 capacitor diagonally between power and ground pins under your BGA, then you're going to have about, you know, one and a half, two nanohenries of loop inductance in that path. That might be smaller than if you put it on the surface, but if you had really short paths and you had wide paths between the power connection and the, and the, and the ground and, and the ground leads, you could get a half a nanohenry. So, it, unfortunately, the answer to the question of do you put it on the bottom of the board or on the top of the board, it depends on how you've routed that capacitor path. Mm -hmm. If you if you can um, if you have the opportunity, use both. Mm -hmm. That is because the more you put in parallel, whatever their inductance is of one, you put them in parallel, and you're going to have you know one over n of the loop inductance. So that's why more is better because of the parallel combination of the Can we place the other capacitor there? I would like to see if there will be change. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to add it. Unfortunately, it's really hard. I, I, I can't really put them in parallel. I could put them in parallel, but they have to kind of go through each other because I just can't fit them in there. Um, and so um, we're not going to see we're still decoupling all of this inductance. I'm going to add the, the electrolytic one over here. I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of change, but let's let's try it and see. Uh, okay, I want to make sure I do this right. Ground is on the inside track. Okay, so I'm going to place it in there.
in <laughs> fact, the bars. look at that. Yeah. <laughs> so I take it out. Oops. There it is. I take it out. Yeah. Hardly any impact at all. There it is. A uh, little bit less. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now it's a bit, but, it's a bit but not much. Yeah. Yeah. Very little impact. Now, what we've been looking at, I want to make sure nothing's getting hot. Yep. Okay. Everything's good. What we've been looking at is switching noise here. You'll notice something happened over here. Let me zoom out in time and I'll show you. This is where um, sometimes more is better. Now, oh, I didn't record it without the, the capacitor in there, but we see it over here. Um, you can get a, get a hint of it over here. You know, the switching noise, the stuff that happens in a short period of time, that was dramatically improved by bringing the capacitor in close proximity. And it didn't matter what the value of the capacitor was it matter, matter, above a threshold, it mattered what the inductance. But this, the what happens after the switching, yeah, it does depend a little bit on the value of the capacitor. Let me put the big one in again. And again, I have to apologize. Let me get the camera back on so you can see what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So here's the the big one. Let me put the big one back in. You can see sure how I'm noisy it is now up. without the capacitor. Well, I've zoomed out in time too. Uh, so here, oh. here we put the big capacitor in, and um, uh, and it's a little bit higher. Yeah. Now, because we've finished looking at the switching noise, let's look at this part. So I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom our scale. So I'm gonna take this guy here. I'm gonna move him down. We're going to zoom in on that and let's, so I want to show you that voltage noise and now let's change the time base so we can see the longer behavior. Okay. So you notice, you know, I'm going to take it out. We're going to, so we finished looking at the switch noise. We're going to mm -hmm. look at the slower stuff. I'm going to take it out and again, I have to get my camera so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to take the capacitor out. Okay, and now you can see uh, we did two things. One is we got a voltage drop. We got more noise here. I mean, I really zoomed in, right? We're at 200 millivolts per division. Mm -hmm. This is the switching noise of the switch mode power supply. I'm drawing a lot of current. It's switching faster. Mm -hmm. This is the noise on the switch mode power supply. But you'll notice it's pretty, the average is pretty small. It's pretty constant. It's, it's a constant value. That's because of the, um, all the currents going through the resistance of the uh, voltage regulator module. But when I put this whopping big capacitor in here, I mean, I have got to make sure I'm doing the right polarity here. Uh, let's see, do it this way. There we go. Okay, did you notice what happened? That, um, hey, look, I I have less drop and now it's slowly being depleted. This is... I'm providing the local charge storage, not just for the DIDT, but also for the slow bleed of the current. Because it's a WAP, it's a thousand microfarads. Mm -hmm. It's giving us all of this current. So to reduce the switching noise, it's not about the amount of capacitance, but this is long-term noise. This is slowly very noise. I can get less noise if my period wasn't a millisecond, but was, you know, tens of microseconds, mm -hmm. I would have reduced the the noise because of the high output resistance of my power supply. Now, let me compare this. Let's save this and I'm going to save it in a new source. Let me save it in three and I'm going to take this. I'm going to move it over to here. We're going to save that. And now let's try our small value capacitor. Okay. So I'm going to get the camera going here. So the and noise will be a little bit higher. So, and not only that, but different time signature, because I don't have very much capacitance to have as a charge source. So here's no capacitor. You get a lot of noise. Now I add my little ceramic one microfarad decoupling capacitor. Did you see any change? Oh. I didn't. I, yeah, switching noise changed a lot, but no impact. It got depleted so quickly because mm -hmm. it's only microfarad. It has no impact over here. So, so this is where I would say, if you're going to have one or two capacitors on the power rail, number one, most important thing that you're using it, 
to reduce switching noise. So you want as low a loop inductance capacitor as you can. And that's all about body size. I want as small a body size capacitor as I can get. And I want to mount it to the power pins with as low a loop inductance path as I can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 0402, you know, if you're doing it by hand, I, I recommend using 1206, easy to, easy to assemble by hand, but you know, machine assembly 0402, close proximity to the power pins. That's the first step. And that eliminates the switching noise, reduces the switching noise. But now, if you want to reduce the stuff after the switching noise, because the slowly varying stuff, then you want to use as large a capacitor as you can. And that's where, so, um, you know, 1206, um, a size like, uh, you know, 22 microfarad, easy to come by, um, makes for, you know, as much capacitance as you can get in a small area. And, and, and so that's why these days with surface mount parts, if you really want to reduce the switching noise, what you do is you put the 0402s, 110 microfarad, in close proximity to the IC, and somewhere else on that power rail, you put a couple of whopping big electrolytics that provide all that extra charge storage so that the charge doesn't come, have to come out of the VRM. So what is it all about these 100 nanofarad capacitors? Legacy. I am shocked. So I, you should put a link to this recording, to a paper that I wrote with my buddies. I, I, I got together the two two world's experts on power distribution, uh, Steve Sandler and Larry Smith. And uh, and so, you know, I've worked with both of them quite a bit. They're, they're my go-to experts. Larry and I wrote a book on power integrity. We worked, worked for five years together on this. And Sandler, we, we get together all the time at conferences and he He's an expert on, on power integrity. He's got a lot of books out there too. And so I got the two of them together. And first of all, it was a lot of fun because um, we disagreed on a lot of things. You get three experts in the room, you're going to have five different opinions. And so we disagreed on that. But one thing we agreed on was this myth about use three different capacitor values. And you read a lot of app notes. Everybody says three different value capacitors, right? A 10, a 1, and a 0.1 microfarad. And a 0.1 microfarad capacitor is a high-frequency capacitor, so that'll reduce the switching noise. Totally wrong. And and so Larry and Steve and I, we wrote an article in Signal Integrity Journal a couple of years back. It's called The Myth of Three Capacitor Values. And so you should... Uh, put a link in, in the show notes or anybody can go to Signal Integrity Journal and search for th myth of three capacitors and you'll see that article. And, and, and we say that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when through-hole components were used, um, it's all about inductance, right? And so the 0.1 microfarad capacitors, like this little one that I have on the board here, is physically small and its inductance is small. Um, uh, and so it has low loop inductance. This whopping big electrolytic one here, um, it's bigger physically and it has more inductance. And so you want the low inductance. And so you use the lowest inductance part you can get. And in a through hole, it's going to be 0.1 microfarad. Um, but you also want high capacitance for exactly what we showed here to handle the lower frequency stuff. But it's not going to do anything for the high frequency because of its long inductance. And so you have multiple capacitors, the one micro, 0.1 microfarad because it's physically small for low loop inductance and the larger capacitors for their, okay, you're getting larger capacitance there. When you're using through hole parts, yep, a couple different values is really valuable. But who uses, through, if, you, if you're worried about switching noise and you have nanosecond edges, you are not going to use through hole capacitors. You're going to use surface mount capacitors. And the inductance of a 0.1 microfarad 0402 and a uh, 10 microfarad 0402 is exactly the same. There is zero value in using a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. And yet, so many application notes say that. It's, I call it legacy code. It's because the people that wrote the app note don't understand the principles we just talked about here. Are they more and expensive? Uh, so I've done some, some look at it. First, I'm not an expert on it, but what I've found is the, 
the cheapest parts are the ones that are used the most in cell phones because that's where a lot of assembly is. And they're using O2O parts these days mostly and even O. 0501 part or 01005 parts. Um, I think he used a pepper shaker to put those on the board. Um, and so the cheapest parts are the ones that are used the most. And 0402 parts are pretty cheap. And I haven't seen a difference in price between a 0.1 and a 10 microfarad mm -hmm. 0402. Um, and so, and given how low cost they are, the assembly, the pick and place costs is larger than the component costs. And so I would advocate it's worth it, even if it's a, a quarter of a cent more, it's worth it using that 10 microfarad 0402 than a 0.1 microfarad. Mm -hmm. the, it is not by intent to use 0.1 microfarad. It should be a, as large in that body size as you can. So. And so why 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 do so many apnos have 0.1 microfarad? It's because the person that wrote the apno doesn't understand how to do decoupling. And I fight this problem with my students all the time. I tell them, I show them they do this experiment, they do the lab, they see that it's not about the capacitance, it's about the inductance, and yet they blindly read some app note that says use a 0.1 microfarad capacitor or three values of a 0.01, a 0.1, and a 1 microfarad capacitor. They read those and they think, well, the person that wrote this must know more than I do. And part of being an engineer is establishing that engineering judgment of confidence in your understanding of what's going on and making your own decisions. And I hope that 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 all of your viewers now understand what the capacitors are doing and make their own decisions. And I hope my students, my students respect you more than they respect me. <laughs> they come to me and, and say, after one of your videos, they come to me and says, oh, you know, Robert, oh my gosh. And, and so they listen to you more than they listen to me. So maybe after viewing this, they will finally realize they are empowered now to make their own engineering decisions about the value of the capacitors. And it's not about the capacitor value, it's about the loop inductance mounting on the board. Okay. Thank you. I, I have one more <laughs> question. I have one more question. Yeah. So what is it all about this PDN graph? How is it connected with all this, what we are talking about? Oh, the impedance profile yeah. of the PDN? Yeah. So we've been just looking at one term, just the inductance in one application. Um, and and why is that? That's because at the frequencies where this edge is switching, let me zoom out a little bit to, to show you that edge switching. At the frequencies where this edge is switching, so, um, and I'll, I'll change that scale a little bit. Let me go back to, which one is it? It's this one here. Oh, I, I zoomed out on the wrong one. Let me zoom out on the, the red one now. Here we go. Um, at the frequencies where this edge is switching, you know, in the nanosec tens of nanoseconds, that's relatively high frequency. This is in the tens, hundreds of megahertz. In that frequency range, the impedance of my chip looking out into the power distribution network. So I'm I'm the chip over here, and I'm looking at this path. I'm going to see in the high frequency the inductance. I'm going to see that high impedance from the inductor. I have to go down to you know relatively low frequency to start you know megahertz to start seeing the capacitance of the capacitors. Um, and so it's the frequencies in the 50 megahertz and below that I'm going to see um, all the different capacitor values and and the rest of the stuff going back to the VRM at the high frequency in this application. It's, I'm going to see the impedance going up with frequency. It's going to be the inductance. And that's why we focus on the inductance because that's the part of the impedance profile that we're paying attention to at these short rise times. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, so for lower frequencies, uh, I think when, uh, even when you use capacitors, all capacitors will actually become inductor after some frequency. That's why. Yes. Inductance yes. They look like inductors, right? Okay. Exactly. And, and it's the inductance in the path and it's about the inductance of the capacitors. Mm -hmm. And we use these PDN graphs because basically here we are uh, kind of working with one frequency. It's not really like one, but it's like one. Well, but... it's the highest frequency yeah. where the edges are. But and this you... is one, one problem. Remember we said it's all about you have to identify the problem, the root cause, and then fix it at the root cause. And in the PDN, there's not one problem. There are 12 different problems. This is just one of the 12 that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. 
and in this PDN graph or in this uh, once you get this PDN impedance then you can actually see it for all the frequencies right right and there are other problems that happen at low frequencies mm -hmm. and, and there are some and resonances and uh, resonances there's the VRM the interaction of the VRM with the system um, all of those right and if you hit the resonance with your signals then everything is going to be much worse right so it's not so simple right. uh, uh, it's... so this is only one of the problems that we're fixing but a very very common problem okay okay thank you so much eric i really hope uh, this will help many people to understand a little bit more about decoupling capacitors because this is like i think super complicated topic yeah and and i'll just uh, put another plug in that um uh, in the textbook I did with Artec on uh, uh, prototype design principles, um, there's a whole chapter on PDN design, and this is the, the main topic because it is such a important common problem, and it is so easy to minimize if you understand the use of decoupling capacitors. And I hope that everybody that writes app notes pays attention to this and so they don't propagate that myth that, oh, I want to use a 0.1 microfarad capacitor because it's a high frequency capacitor. Yeah, if you're building through hole parts, it is, but not if we're doing surface mount parts. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Okay. It's been talking with you. And uh, that's everything for this video. Thank you very much, Eric, for this great interview and thank you for watching, liking and commenting. We are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel Online courses where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again and see you next time. Bye.